Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the first section of the 14th module of the History of Christianity II course. In previous modules, we looked at the Church in North America in the early parts of the 20th century, with the theological liberals, fundamentalists, and evangelicals. Many of those movements and others continued to influence the Church and society in the West. And these led up to a period of intense upheaval and change with ongoing consequences that we still experience today. In this section, and in the next two as well, we'll explore a series of loosely related events and movements all under the umbrella of the 60s. These events and ideas are important to understand because they're still exercising a profound influence on our world today. We're going to break this up into three separate sections, but they're all related in various ways. In the first section, we'll look more generally at the background causes and the events that came out of them in this time period. We'll see that the forces of darkness were gaining ground and the damages that were done. In the second, we'll look at how those momentous times affected and changed Western society on a number of issues. We'll see how and why each issue was addressed in the 60s. We'll look at a few categories of problems that came to a head in that time period and the responses attempted to solve those problems. And we'll see why most of those responses did not work, and they often made things worse because they were based on approaches that ignored and or rejected God and His wisdom. And in the final section, we'll look at what the Church was doing during this tumultuous time and how it responded to the revolutionary changes. And we'll see what God was doing in His mercy and grace to hold back the darkness. And I've also assigned two supplementary clips to illustrate the topics that we're covering in this module. That's what this entire module will cover. Now let's plunge into this first section which covers the background in historical events and movements of the 60s. And we'll start with the timeline to give the relative time of these people and events in comparison with what we've already seen. Some of these events and people are background to the 60s, some are events of the 60s that we'll examine in this section, and some are related to issues that will be explained in the next section. Now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau lived from 1712 through 1778, Karl Marx was 1818 through 1883, Friedrich Nietzsche lived from 1844 through 1900, and those were some of the major influencers whose ideas impacted the 60s. Now we'll zoom in on the events that their ideas triggered and influenced. Playboy magazine began publishing in 1953. The Vietnam War was from 1954 through 1975. The birth control pill became widely available in 1960. President John Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. The civil rights legislation was passed in 1964. The Beatles first came to America in 1964. The Great Society legislation was passed in 1964 and 1965. The Summer of Love was in 1967, and the Woodstock Music Festival was in 1969. Now, plenty of things happened in a relatively short time period. Now, let's try to make sense of all the things that happened in the 60s. We'll try to summarize the big picture of what happened, but more importantly, why it happened. Now, this will only be a bare-bones survey, and we'll leave out a lot in order to get the big picture conclusions. Now, I believe there's plenty of evidence for my conclusions, but I'm not going to have time to give it all. I'm going to suggest that the events of the 60s represent a revolution, or rather, they were a turning point in a revolution that had been ongoing for a long time. This was not a political or military revolution, but it had significant political and social fallout. It was a revolution of worldviews. The 60s were a turning point where alternate worldviews, which had been challenging the Christian worldview, made significant impact and possibly gained or exercised the upper hand in many parts of Western society. We see this in phrases that are used to describe this time, such as the sexual revolution and the countercultural revolution, among others. In this section, we'll look at some of the forces that led into this, how they worked to undermine the Christian worldview, and some of the results. Then in the next section, 
we'll look at how people attempted to apply this revolutionary worldview in a variety of ways in the 60s, and how it was unable to solve society's problems, and in many ways made them worse. We'll see the consequences of this revolutionary worldview change. Now, remember the iceberg illustration, that our worldview is determined by our theology, and our worldview impacts our beliefs and values, which determine our actions. So, when the prevailing worldview of a society was dramatically shifted away from God, it trickled down to impact the values and actions of much of society. Now, because most of us were born after this shift, it is more difficult to realize how radically different things were beforehand. And we must recognize that even Christians living after this shift still uncritically buy into some parts of an anti-Christian worldview because this is the pervasive mindset in which we have lived. So a lot of this section in the next will try to help us recognize these assumptions and how they are now working in our world, and to compare them with the different assumptions that are based more on a Christian worldview, and how we can bring our personal worldview into conformity with Christ and live it out in a society pervaded by a contrary mindset, and to reject and work against any anti-Christian assumptions of our society's prevailing worldview. So, let's look at the background and context of the forces contributing to these worldview revolutions. The, the background is extremely complicated, and I'll only be able to outline some general trends. But in another sense, it's profoundly simple, and I'll try to summarize it all in easily understandable categories in just a bit. There were a lot of prior influences that all kind of came together to cause the 1960s. First are the things that we've already covered in earlier sections, like the movements of rationalism and modernism, which pursued an alternate to Christianity based on the idolatry of human science and reason. And we saw that theological liberalism weakened or killed some parts of the church as a result. And some of the fundamentalists responded by withdrawing from social institutions, abandoning them to ungodly influence and control. The evangelicals had worked to return to social influence, but had not yet gained enough influence to slow the bad influence of secular worldviews. The evangelicals were gaining in strength and health, but their greatest social contributions were still future. All of that was the longer-term results of rationalism on the church and society. And you may remember that when I introduced rationalism as an idolatry of thinking, I also mentioned another movement called Romanticism, which is an idolatry of feeling. Now, in some ways, Romanticism is the opposite of rationalism and a reaction against it. But in other ways, it's just the mirror image, the opposite side of the exact same coin, leading to similar results of trusting in ourselves and our own judgment as the final authority. Now, Romanticism can also be traced back to the ideas of Hume and Kant which I mentioned in an earlier section, because they located knowledge only in the human mind. But Romanticism really got its start from a man named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. His famous statement is, Man was born free, but is everywhere in chains. That is, the idea that humanity is basically good and is only corrupted by our environment. Therefore, according to Rousseau, if we free ourselves from the hang-ups of conventional ideas and do what comes naturally, we'll be happier. That is the start of the idea of living out our authentic selves. Now, that's seen in modern expressions like follow your heart and be true to yourself. Rousseau wrote, I do not derive these rules from the principles of the higher philosophy. I find them in the depths of my heart traced by nature in characters which nothing can efface. I need only consult myself with regard to what I wish to do. What I feel to be right is right. What I feel to be wrong is wrong. And Rousseau started the idea of permissive parenting and the idea in education that children should be allowed to follow their own ideas. And he also promoted the idea of the noble savage. The people in a more primitive state were more virtuous and peaceful and true, living in harmony with nature and with one another. 
and he therefore argued against the idea of private property. And another of Rousseau's influential ideas was the social contract. This was an attempt to explain how societies work together and how humans seem to have an innate sense of right and wrong that allows civilizations to function. But his purpose in promoting that idea was to explain those things without any reference to God or transcendent morality. But his idea leads to a huge contradiction, because according to Rousseau, the individual following their natural inclinations must also subsume their freedom to what he called the general will in the social contract. And that results in a totalitarian a totalitarian state governed by the people. And individuals who oppose the general will, will on this view, must be punished by exile or death. So the philosophy that elevated individual feeling over everything else turned out to be collectivist and totalitarian. However, the, the underlying problem is that Rousseau was simply wrong. And I hope you recognized how much of his ideas were directly contradictory to biblical teaching. The problem of humanity is not civilization. The problem is sin. And our natural impulses are broken by sin and wickedness. Jeremiah wrote, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And Jesus said, Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. According to the Bible, following our heart will lead to destruction. And history shows that civilization actually restrains sin, at least to some extent. And a good education trains children away from their sinful impulses into virtue. And we see this in everyday experience. Those children who are always given their way and allowed to run wild, they turn into insufferable brats who grow up to be unsuccessful and miserable because they have no self-control or discipline. But children who have been lovingly disciplined are typically well-behaved and they grow up successful because the discipline that they receive from the outside is internalized into self-discipline and virtue and therefore results in success. And we also see that more primitive peoples are just as sinful and selfish and violent as anyone else, sometimes more so. And an honest look at history will show that. I think Rousseau, if he were honest with himself, he probably suspected that he was not telling the entire truth, though he was too proud to admit it. I suspect that either consciously or unconsciously, a lot of what he taught was only a smokescreen so that he could throw off the moral restraints of civilization in order to do what he wanted. Because Rousseau was a selfish, sinful man who hurt and abandoned the people around him, including his children, all of whom were illegitimate and sent to a state institution where many children died. And the leaders after the French Revolution were influenced by Rousseau, which led to the Reign of Terror. Now, in the previous section, we talked about another of the anti-God ideologies that were influenced by Romanticism, and that is Marxism. Marxism intentionally rejects God. Marx wrote, Communism begins where atheism begins. And Marxism applied Rousseau's ideas of the public good through totalitarian conformity. And after Marx, his ideas and approaches were morphed, disguised, and injected into the West through the ideas of people like Antonio Gramsci, Herbert Marcuse, and Saul Alinsky. These are the ideas often summarized as cultural Marxism or critical theory, and those influences had a profound effect on the 60s. And they're experiencing a resurgence in popularity today, because people haven't learned from history how harmful those ideas are. When God is rejected, the state becomes a god. But the god of state has no morals and has no mercy. And in that view, humans have no value, except as useful to the state. So the state has no problem using or disposing of people as it sees fit. Now, Marxism tried to hide its totalitarian influences under fine-sounding promises, 
But another philosopher of that time, who was also influenced by Romanticism, a man named Friedrich Nietzsche, he was quite open about the inevitable consequences of this ideology. He started with the assumption that God is dead, and he actually criticized religion for showing mercy and doing charity for the weak and needy. He recognized that if there is no God, there is no morality. So he said, we have to make up our own morality. But the only real morality, according to his philosophy, is the desire and the power to get your own way, to enforce your own desires. So in this philosophy, the will to power is the ultimate goal. And the ideal human is the one who seizes power and imposes his will on society without regard to anything but his own will and desire. Now, Nietzsche was not a moral man, to put it mildly, and he lived out his philosophy until he had a mental breakdown and went insane. And Nietzsche was very influential on the anarchist movement, as well as on Hitler and the Nazis in Germany, and the postmodernists and the existentialists. And the same moral hypocrisy and contradiction of Rousseau also characterized the postmodernists. Postmodern philosophers like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida, they've clearly stated that part of their motivation for their philosophy was to deny moral absolutes so that they could justify their sexual behavior. Postmodernists start from the fact that we all learn and understand things from a different vantage point and experience, but from there they extrapolate to argue that therefore there are no moral absolutes. And for the record, I have to agree that if we start from ourselves, or even from collective human wisdom, there are no moral absolutes. But I would argue that the fatal flaw of postmodernism is that it starts with the assumption that God doesn't exist, and that all knowledge is limited to humanity. But if God does exist, all of postmodernism's arguments make no sense and postmodernism becomes self-contradictory and cynically deceptive. Like I said, they argued there are no absolutes because they wanted freedom from moral rules. But postmodernism then sneaks in their own absolutes, which are more tyrannical. Have you noticed how quickly some groups went from demanding tolerance for their viewpoint to persecuting anyone who politely declined to bake a cake celebrating their viewpoint? Now, if you want to pursue that idea further, I recommend a book by D.A. Carson called The Intolerance of Tolerance. You see, there is no way not to have moral rules. It's just a battle over whose moral rules will be enforced. If Jesus is not acknowledged as king, someone else always tries to claim his crown. Postmodernism claimed there is no overarching story or purpose because they want to determine their own purpose, and yet they claim to be on the right side of history, which they rewrite to serve their purposes. Postmodernists say that any truth claim is just making a power play to gain power over others because they want to deflect any truth that disproves their preferences, and yet they make plenty of truth claims to gain and exercise power. Postmodernity is a self-contradictory philosophy, and that is on purpose. It is sophistry in order to obscure truth and reject moral responsibility. Now, like I said, there is some sliver of truth in postmodernity, as I mentioned, but it is only used to accuse others and excuse the sinful self. The postmodernists are correct that we finite humans, we don't know everything. But Christians have been saying that for thousands of years. We are not God. Christians acknowledge there is a real God, and therefore acknowledge that there is real truth and meaning, while postmodernists try to substitute themselves as gods. Yes, of course, postmodern philosophy is more complicated than I've made it, but I've tried to cut to the bottom line of evaluation for our purposes. Now, all of these philosophies and ideologies so far, they share a common conclusion. Did you notice that they all agree with what the serpent promised in Genesis chapter 3? 
the serpent basically said, forget God and be like God, determining good and evil for yourself. And that's the conclusion of all of these romantic philosophies. Aleister Crowley summarized his form of Satanism as, do what you will. Do whatever you want without reference to God. Be a law unto yourself. Everyone, do what is right in your own eyes. And that summarizes the mindset and worldview that stands behind the rebellion and revolutions of the 60s. Now, I also want to briefly mention the existentialists, such as Albert Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre. They shared the same basic philosophy of Romanticism, but their philosophy highlighted the despair and hopelessness in contemporary life, because without God, there is no transcendent meaning or purpose. Their philosophy was kind of like the despair of Ecclesiastes on steroids. Vanity of vanity, all is meaningless. And yet it didn't have the God-centered corrective that Ecclesiastes has. But existentialism, ironically, called for living as if there is purpose, even though life has no purpose, by making up your own purpose. Again, if the real God is rejected, false gods rush in to take his place. Now, you might remember the optimism of the modernists that had been proved false by two world wars, the Great Depression, and the specter of nuclear annihilation, and that was replaced by pessimism. An overall attitude of a lack of purpose and hopelessness had fallen on much Western society. Now, finally, I also want to mention the militant atheists who worked to get God out of public life. Now, living after those times, it might seem strange to think about. But up until relatively recently, the Christian worldview was pervasive and the dominant worldview of all parts of life, both public and private in the West. The Bible was taught in American schools. All public events began with Christian prayer. And even non-believers generally knew the content of the Bible and the Christian explanation of the world. Taking Christianity out of education has had huge detrimental effects. In a book called America to Pray or Not to Pray, David Barton used statistics to argue that after prayer and religious instruction was taken out of schooling, academic achievement dropped significantly, and evidence of vices such as teen pregnancy and crime increased significantly. Again, living after the fact, it's difficult to understand how much things have changed. But your grandparents might have told you that they didn't lock their doors at night, and their children were safe to walk to school on their own. Marriages lasted, sexual perversion was rare, and children were not confused about their genders. Christianity was pervasive in one way or another as the dominant worldview, and it showed. But some people purposely used the courts to gradually remove Christianity from the public square, and it had detrimental consequences. Now, those are some of the background influences going into the 60s that came from the enemies of God, trying to rebel against God. Now, all of that is to say that much of this culture war is just a reflection of the eternal battle between good and evil that has been taking place for all of history. It is between a God-centered, God-acknowledging worldview, and a man-centered, God-rejecting worldview. But all this happened in Western cultures that had been dominated by Christianity for centuries. This rebellion ultimately was the outgrowth first of the roller coaster of decline and faithfulness in the churches. And that worked out in the division in the churches between God-honoring, God-centered people and those who mostly ignored God even though they claim to believe in him and serve him. In other words, this rebellion did not start with open rebellion, but with apathy and coasting. The secular ignoring of God always turns into opposing God. Like Jesus taught, when a demon leaves, if the room is not filled with something else, it brings back seven more worse. The revolution was the result of the aggression of the enemies of God, but it was also a result of the failure of the church to fulfill its mission. Its mission to honor God 
with its lifestyle and worship, to disciple its children, and to evangelize the society. Now, there are a few other background items that I want to briefly mention. This was the time of the post-war baby boom and prosperity. The economy was booming because of rising consumerism, and inventions and new technology were just starting to take off. On the one hand, those were the easy times that make men weak. But on the other hand, there was the Cold War and the constant threat of nuclear annihilation. And there was a growing disillusion with the establishment. And that was the beginning of the generation gap between parents and children, with the car culture, the glorifying of rebellion, and the beginnings of rock and roll. And there were still unresolved tensions between ethnic groups. So the 60s began looking all bright and hopeful on the surface. A youthful and idealistic John F. Kennedy was elected president with promises of hope. But beneath the surface, there were troubles brewing on many fronts. And very early in the 60s was the great shock of Kennedy's assassination, which caused a dramatic shift towards despair and pessimism, and an opening for the voices calling for radical change. Now, let's shift gears and survey some of the things that happened in the 60s, which illustrate the revolutionary character of that decade. First is what has been called the counterculture. Now, to understand the counterculture, we need to recognize that it happened in a few forms or a few levels. First, there were philosophers, academics, and influencers. Those are the people who pushed this movement for philosophical and or ideological reasons. These people typically consciously wanted to overturn all of Western culture and its values. Some early examples are people like Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and Timothy Leary, who promoted drugs, deviant sexuality, and Eastern religion. And it also included some postmodernist and cultural Marxist, who promoted an oppressor versus oppressed view of the world and taught that all of society is a power struggle. But then there were also the popularizers. And as the label implies, these people put those revolutionary ideas in a more palatable form to disseminate them to the wider culture, typically through popular media and literature. Uh, some of these people understood what they were doing, but some were just kind of going along because it seemed hip and cool. And the most famous of these was probably the Beatles. They were great songwriters and musicians, but behind the clean-cut early image was plenty of immorality and they introduced Eastern spirituality and drugs to many people through their music. And there were many others in pop culture, pop art, and popular media that spread and popularized countercultural ideas. And then finally were the masses, those who bought into and lived out the counterculture. Now, as a whole, they rejected the earlier, at least nominally Christian worldview and culture and morality and pursued alternate lifestyles. They were reacting against the perceived emptiness, materialism, and hypocrisy of the older generation. And to be clear, there was plenty of ground for that. It is never hard to find imperfections and hypocrisy in any person or group. Humans are always flawed and sinful. But it's one thing to find fault in others, and another thing to do any better yourself. It's like the old joke that every teenager thinks their parents are stupid until they get out on their own and have to fend for themselves, and then they suddenly realize that their parents weren't that dumb after all. Now, one example of the countercultural masses was the hippies. They typically grew their hair and wore certain kinds of clothes, often neglected hygiene and tried to live simple lives, which often meant being vagrant and using drugs. But not all of the counterculture was hippies. There were many young people and even older people who kept respectable jobs and respectable haircuts, yet they still bought into the revolutionary worldview and morality. They were just more subtle or sneaky in the way that they lived it out. So the counterculture was the replacement of previous worldview and morality with a different worldview and morality. For the counterculture, 
Christianity was no longer truth, but only an option or values that were held by some, but certainly no longer universally authoritative. They rejected objective morality, saying everything is subjective, and replaced it with various alternate moralities, which they usually enforced with just as much zeal as the average Pharisee. But it was defended on the basis of personal preference and freedom. The rallying cry was, if it feels good, do it. But there was a dark side, as we'll explore in detail later. What started with Rousseau led to Charles Manson, who corrupted young girls to commit brutal murders that shocked the nation. And the counterculture was also typically a protest culture. There were famous and infamous protests and protest movements throughout the 60s, including riots on college campuses and in many cities. In an earlier section, I suggested that the term liberal and conservative are sometimes not helpful until you define more specifically what kind of freedom a liberal is pursuing, or specifically what a conservative is trying to conserve. In a similar way, the activity of protest can be good or bad, depending partly on the manner of protest, but mostly on what someone is protesting for or against. So let me try to be more specific. The counterculture most famously protested against the war in Vietnam, but also against racist Jim Crow laws and other forms of discrimination. And because of the revolutionary nature of many in the counterculture, this protest mentality was aimed against pretty much everything in their parents' generation, especially traditional morality. A pamphlet that was produced by the free speech movement at Berkeley said, because politics and education are inseparable, the main purpose of the university should not be passing along the morality of the middle class, nor the morality of the white man, nor even the morality of the potpourri we call Western society. Many wanted to tear absolutely everything down, especially anything related to Christ, in order to rebuild some ideal utopia. And they were just using Vietnam and Jim Crow as an excuse to do so. Now, evaluated by biblical standards, some of those reasons for protest were good and some of them were bad. And then what the counterculture was for, they were for absolute freedom of expression, including profanity, blasphemy, and pornography. Absolute sexual freedom, which was euphemistically called free love. They were for free use of drugs, racial harmony, experimentation with Eastern religions and new philosophies, cool music. Now, all of this was typically tied with radical left politics and economics. And again, from a biblical standpoint, some of that was good and some was bad. And among the counter and protest cultures, there was a pervasive embrace of Eastern religions and religious ideas. Various forms of Hinduism and Buddhism and their ideas were influential in the 60s. Now, they were typically not practiced in their original forms like they're practiced in the Far East, but they became disguised and westernized in a syncretistic mishmash of beliefs and practices that were typically called New Age spirituality. And people in the mainstream were even introduced to practices like meditation and yoga, and they talked about karma and inner light. And among the counterculture, there were many, many gurus and charlatans who gathered the young seekers around their charismatic leadership in a variety of new religious groups, and many of which, or most of which, led to cult practices and abuses. So all of these ideas together formed an idealistic hope among the counterculture that they would bring in a new age of peace and love just by being peaceful and loving. Now, of course, that was also typically accompanied by sex and drugs and Eastern religious practices and cool music. The youth culture encouraged gathering together to bring in this age of Aquarius. And that was the promotion behind things like the Summer of Love in 1967, where thousands of young people gathered in San Francisco, primarily but also in other major cities, 
and the Woodstock Music Festival in 1969, which was billed as three days of peace and music. In other words, there was an assumption and an attempt that feeling loving and peaceful by the countercultural definitions of those words, that would actually change reality and bring about a new age of peace and love. However, the real world is more complicated than that, and that hoped for new age of enlightenment never came about. Just disillusionment when this optimistic experiment failed. Because reality does not conform to our feelings, even if we live under the romantic worldview of the idolatry of feelings. Because it is impossible to truly love and find peace without Christ. It is impossible to live that out without the power of God. I'll remind you of the Reformation ideas of Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. What I mean by that is just like it's impossible to live by good works without Jesus and the new birth, it's also impossible to find genuine peace and love without Christ and the new birth. Good works do not cause the new birth, but flow out of it. And in the same way, peace and love do not cause new life, but are the result of it. And to try to find them without Christ is like the false prophets who cried, peace, peace, where there is no peace. To hope that humanity can somehow generate peace and love just by willing it, that's hopelessly silly. Someone once said, to be an optimist is to be naive, but to be a pessimist is atheistic. Therefore, being a Christian means having no hope in ourselves, but having abundant hope only in God, who is working through his people to redeem humanity and create new humanity. But the counterculture failed to bring about what it hoped for, because it left out God. Without him, we can do nothing. Now, there's a lot that happened in the 60s that we've not yet covered. Some of this we'll cover in the next section, where we will examine a lot of issues that were argued in the 60s. And with that, let's review. The counterculture was primarily built on anti-God assumptions and worldview, most strongly influenced by the idolatry of feeling coming out of Romanticism. They rejected objective Judeo-Christian morality and substituted hedonism. They rejected traditional cultural values and substituted Eastern spirituality, married with drug culture and Marxist politics. And it became very tempting and hard to resist for young people at that time because they were disillusioned with what had gone before and because the counterculture had all the cool music and the pretty girls. And they were the ones who seemed to be having all the fun. And they promised a new age of peace and love. The counterculture was a popular revolutionary force for a lot of the 60s, but they ultimately failed to change society for the better. And as we'll see in the next section, the 60s represent an overall change in society for the worse, even though they had some really cool music. Now, let me give you a few questions for discussion and application, based on what we've seen so far about the 60s. First, describe the worldview and mindset that was behind the radical changes of the 60s. What were the main ideas that the philosophies taught and promoted, and how did those ideas influence what happened in the 60s? How do those worldviews explain the counter counterculture and various social revolutions? What principles can you draw from the connection between those ideas and their results? How can those principles help you to navigate the issues that you face in your own life and ministry? And in what ways do you expect to put those insights into practice? Second, based on what you've learned so far about the changes that happened in the 60s, what are the long-term results that you see in current culture that can be traced back to the revolutionary changes of the 60s? And based on biblical standards, what changes do you think were good? What were the long-term results? And what changes do you think were bad? What are the long-term consequences of those changes that you see in your own situation? What have you learned from this section that will help you to work against 
the detrimental consequences? How can you work backwards from those to address and correct the underlying worldview that caused the problems? And what actions do you plan to take based on what you've learned? And third, what else have you learned from this section, and how do you intend to apply that insight in your own life and ministry? Now, like I said at the beginning, this is just the first part of our examination of the radical changes of the 60s. So you can expect more discussion questions in the later sections, and we'll look at the guiding principles after we've covered more of this material. So that's all for this section. In the next main section, we'll look at a number of issues that were central to the social change of the 60s. We'll look at how they were addressed, and we'll evaluate if things were changed for the better or for the worse, or perhaps some of both, in regard to each issue. But before that section, I've required a brief supplementary video to give some context and insight to what we'll cover in the next section. And you'll find the link to the supplementary material below. And I'll see you in the next main section. Thanks for watching.